I truly do believe that um, fields like psych, sociology, anthropology, English literature, all that stuff, it's like a Ponzi scheme. Because of the job market, I have seen most of my collaborators or colleagues or co-students leave psychology. It's tough to be in psychology if you're set on getting a tenure track position. Yeah. That's going to be a hard road. In this video, I'm speaking with close friend and cognitive scientist, Dr. John Wilder. John did his undergraduate studies at St. John's University in Minnesota. He then went on to earn his master's and PhD in cognitive psychology, as well as a master's degree in computer science at Rutgers University in New Jersey. He has since completed postdoctoral fellowships in human and computer vision at York University and the University of Toronto, has been a sessional instructor at Northeastern University's Vancouver campus, and has recently secured a full-time teaching position at Northeastern's Toronto campus in the area of data analytics. In this video, we talk about the often grim, though not as often spoken realities of pursuing a PhD in academic psychology. So like here, you, it's it's pretty easy to see that like the kind of things you're studying, they unlike a lot of areas of psychology, and this is what we're like. I, I kind of want to get into now. Yep. Unlike a lot of areas of psychology, what you're doing, and and a lot of it has to do with the fact that you weren't just doing psych, you were doing computer science. Like what you're doing has more application than I would probably guess ninety plus percent of psychology PhDs are getting. Right, because you you're getting everything they're getting. You're getting the statistical software and an analytical software. You're getting the research methodology and design. Plus, you can program. Plus, yeah. you're doing things that maybe you could market yourself to Oculus for. You know what I mean? Things like that. Whereas, um, and I remember. So, like you remember, like I was really keen when I first got there, and around November, I had like let's just be honest, I had a full on breakdown. Um, and it was because like, I realized this was not for me. I realized that, um, I found doing so science really tedious and like, I had always found it that way in undergrad. I think I kind of always just hoped that like, once it was me in grad school, I would like it better because it's my project, but I really didn't. <laughs> or, or, or once you're a faculty member. Yeah, you you manage the big picture. You don't do the dirty work exactly. anymore. And so and you, you got grad students for it. Yeah, an yeah. army of them. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and so my thinking was, it's like, I would have been willing to put up with the tedium for a decade if, if, if I knew there was a very good chance that if I worked hard, I would get tenure because yep. then I focus on big picture stuff. And to me, that would have been worth the sacrifice easily. Yep. Um, but then I started looking in, and I started realizing, oh my God, this job market is horrific. Like, you know, like the University of Ohio or, you know, whatever, like even like 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 a, a university that's like not a, you know, a big fancy deal like Penn State or Wayne State University, like if they post a tenure track position tomorrow for psych, which they won't because they, mm -hmm. they do everything they possibly can to avoid doing that. They will have bigger classroom sizes. They'll have grad students and postdocs and adjunct and sessional instructors teach the class. They'll do I watched for years. What? See, I watched McMaster for years, hoping they would list a position that would fit me. And yeah. like it there, then there was hiring freezes and it just never yeah. came. And it's like, oh, that would have been ideal. Yeah. And so when I realized that and so and like, so, you know, you were my best friend in the program. So, you know, naturally you became one of my reference points. And I remember talking to you during my time of suffering. And like, I think I expressed to you my fear that we this might not be fruitful in the long run. And you told me something like you were kind of already aware of that before you even applied. It's just, I think your exact words were, I wanted to have fun. And like, this was <laughs> fun for you. And yeah, yeah. so here's my thing. It's like, okay, number one, I don't think I'm having anywhere near as much fun as John is. Um, so that's out. <laughs> right? I can't use that to justify myself. Yeah. And then, and so two, if I'm not, if you're having more fun than me, you're going to be put, going the extra mile more than me because it's fun for you. Yeah. Yeah. Right, like with me in these YouTube videos, I fucking love it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I go the extra mile all the time, but I was cutting corners because I didn't like what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And then when you combine that with how bad the job market is, and it's just like, the odds are horrible. And if I'm dragging myself and, and not going the extra mile for the next six years, like I probably wasn't going to get the professorship anyway. Now I'm definitely not going to. Yeah. And then once again, comparing to you. So I think like you have a better chance of getting it than me because you're more into it. But second off, even if you don't, 
you're getting a concurrent master's in computer science. Like when we were first hanging out, like I remember in your free time when you weren't hanging with me or your other friends and you weren't doing your psych stuff, you were learning Python on your own. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm like, I did that. Right. And so I just felt like if John doesn't get a tenured position, he can market himself to any number of tech uh, outfits and get a job that would be relevantly similar enough to his training and would pay him enough to justify all the sacrifices you would have made and not got tenure. But like, it basically there was, there were viable silver medals for you. Mm -hmm. Whereas with me, like, what am I going to offer the, the open market by saying I spent the last eight years studying how children generalize their earliest verbs? <laughs> right. So that's a big difference there. And I'll, like, I've been wanting to talk to you about this in detail for years. But to be honest, like, I kind of like we, we have touched on it a bit, but I'll just admit, like, I kind of held back because it's like the mere fact of us talking about it. It's casting negative attention on what you're invested in. And I felt like it's like you're kind of in a situation not too dissimilar from the one that I was afraid of. Mm -hmm. So why would I want to bring this up to my one of my best friends, right? But but like it's not an accident that like I pitched this idea to you a few weeks after you got a fantastic job. Yeah, yeah. When you started at Northeastern's new Toronto campus and they're like data analytics or what yeah, what's yeah. the position? Yeah, it's it's a teaching position full time but non tenure track. They're right. getting away from the tenure model. Yeah. Um in in analytics. And right. so that's not computer science, it's not psychology, but my background has prepared me for doing this. Um, right. Especially because I have been involved in, in machine learning and computer vision, and analytics is starting to make use of so much more of that. Yes. Um, and so my, my guess here is that your relevant training in this domain was more in the direction of, like the comp sci part probably helped you more than the psych part, I'm guessing, by a long shot. I'm not so sure. Hmm. Okay. Um, so that would that would have set me apart on the machine learning ends of things. Yeah. But like when I was taking computer science courses in like pattern recognition and other machine learning sorts of things, and we would talk about running experiments to see like which model is better, which classifier you know predicts better, and they started talking about like statistics. These were statistics we covered in psychology in undergrad. So different sort of like ANOVAs, t-tests, yeah, just just descriptive statistics, all of those things. These students in computer science had never heard before. Okay, so it and, really it was like fifty-fifty, maybe in a way. Yeah, um, th there is a lot of, of of probability that that some of the computer scientists don't get unless they really do get deep into machine learning. Like, yeah. um, I think I think if you have a good like AI class. They'll talk about a lot about probability and and Bayesian statistics and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but I think in psychology, in in specifically cognitive psychology, this is a little bit more common to to get. And in in statistics is a huge focus in psychology, and so that's that's really helpful. Gosh. Okay. So so it was deliberate. It was directly helpful. If you so let's pretend like okay like everything is the exact same except you didn't do the masters in computer science and you didn't learn python like you did everything you do but minus the computational aspects beyond like matlab like advanced statistical software what sorts of jobs do you think you would have had a reasonable chance of getting outside of academia that you think would have been like you know what it's not a gold medal, but it's a silver medal that justifies like the sacrifices I made. Like, what do you think mm -hmm. would be available to you? So, um, because of the job market, I have seen most of my collaborators or colleagues or co-students leave psychology. Right. Um, and I would say the biggest thing they do is become data scientists. So they're, they're tapping yeah. their statistical analytics background. Exactly. And okay. and that's why, like, yes, it's tough to be in psychology. If you're set on getting a tenure track position, yeah. that's going to be a hard road. But unlike some fields, I do feel like there is, you, your degree is still preparing you for something. You just have to, to pivot quite a bit. And 
one of the big problems is is you might not get help on that in your department because you're right. there with a bunch of faculty who love what they do and they got the tenure position they got the tenure yeah. position so so yeah. for them it's like yeah people can do this like this is something that that can be done so yeah. my students should be able to do it i love it this is what i love to do i'm hiring students who i think love this and want to do this right why would they want to leave and go to data science so yeah. so like you're in this environment where that kind of is seen as a failure yeah. or like like or it's just not promoted and and so that's what makes it either a failure to or a sellout or you were never really um sufficiently devout to the faith yes yes yeah. and 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 i think like so i i do think there's potential for people going into cognitive psychology i don't think it's like a dead end okay um uh but but you have to find the support um because not all the faculty members are going to going to know that process because they haven't done it. They don't know how to get into data science because they, they didn't they never had to. They got um, the job. Yeah. And, and <laughs> they so were the one in 400, although back in their days it might have only been one in 100 or something. It yes. wasn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um and so that's why one uh, uh I'll let you explain the analogy you give about baseball. Yeah, yeah. Um because it was recently thinking about this that I realized it is a little bit different in psychology. Um, but but if you want to go ahead with the Oh, so you mean like about the mental health aspect of it? No, just minor leagues. It is graduate school the minor leagues. Yeah, and then, and then, so the idea is this is I, I, years ago I read a book by an ex-Toronto Blue Jay. I, I'm a big Jays fan from Toronto, Ron from Toronto. Um his name is Dirk Hayhurst and he spent most of his career in baseball in the minors. And he did get a, he actually did make it to the majors and he you know, he had a few years of partial, you know, part-time participation on the major league team and he talked about how for years he was just riddled with anxiety and depression because here's this guy who probably since he was like 10 was one of the best athletes if not the best athlete in his school and then it's like he finishes high school and he gets drafted by the San Diego Padres it's like oh my god Dirk like got drafted by the Padres and he's in the minors and he's in the minors for a long time and 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 you start getting to the point where you start realizing as a minor league player like this might not happen to me it's becoming an increasingly real possibility that i'm going to have to hang up my spikes at the age of like 32 and there really is no silver medal it's not like the gold medals making it to the majors and making a few million to tens of millions a year for a bunch of years and just being set um it's not like if you don't make the majors, here's this job where you're going to make 110 grand a year in the baseball field for the rest of your life. Like, no, it's like, it, it, it it's really bad. And, and then also it's like, unless you're a high ranking um, prospect, in which case you will get like a sizable signing bonus. It might be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or several million. Like the actual pay rate for a minor league player is comparable to a grad student. They're, they're basically like Mormon missionaries. They're, they're, they're on a stipend and so are grad students. And, and so it's like the analogy here is when it comes to the mental health is um, the advice that, you know, people always say, do what you love and you'll never do a, you'll never work a day in your life. That is often just horrible advice. Like it needs to be practical because it's like with Dirk Hayhurst, he was doing what he loved but he was no longer having fun because like that kid in the schoolyard playing at recess is having so much more fun than he was because that kid is just playing baseball for fun. He's playing for his life. He is every time he takes a ball in his hand, he's thinking, don't fuck this up. Don't fuck this up. You know what I mean? Because you could just like, like he's thinking like, I might have to hang up my spikes and I will all of a sudden be basically not much better off than the average C student from my high school. I'll have to go right back to the drawing board. Maybe I'll become a plumber. Maybe I'll go back to college at the age of 32, right? Like, it's very scary. And I so, mean, it's, it's, it's your feeling in grad school. It's like, I'm not having fun doing this. Yes. Like, I want to get to the end. I don't want to do this. It's, it's like... Right. And, and, and it makes it very scary. And so the thing that was fun... It's kind of like in like psychology, they've, they've done those studies with kids, you know these ones, where like the kids who like drawing, they get them to draw pictures and then they start paying them for each picture they draw and then they stop paying them and the kids that were initially drawing for free and then got paid, stopped drawing because it stopped being primarily about the fun and started being primarily about the, you know, the outcome. 
Yeah. Um, and it's like, so it's like, it, it, this is another way to kind of pollute your intrinsic joy. It's mm -hmm. like right now in a lot of ways, I'm doing videos on psych and whatnot, because like, I kind of feel like a tenured professor now, like, cause I have financial security. And so I get to explore yeah. the ideas I want when I want, how I want. And it's not like, I'm not planning on making a nickel off of YouTube ever. So it's not like I'm living and dying based on how much people like my, my ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's very scary. That's it. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, don't follow the advice of doing what you love. Like you want to like make sure it's practical and, and then and do it on the side. Nothing stopping right. you from seeing Tinker books. Yeah. So like, I do think that's a good point is in grad school, you need to have a life too. So yeah. you still need hobbies. Like if science is your hobby and your job, you're going to burn out. And yes. it will become all about the job and not fun. Right. Um, that's how I feel. Because I was, as I've told you, you know, I'm an extremely slow reader. And so <laughs> like, for me to read a chapter would take longer than you probably. And, and so I remember like, the thing is, is that like, I loved cognitive science, but it wasn't the only thing I loved. And the thing is, what I was finding was, it's like, if I pursue this path, it's basically this and just about only this and that or everything else like i don't get to study economics when i like economics i don't get to because i don't have time yep uh, so and yeah so that was just some of the things that happened for me that just worked out like i got lucky where yeah. before graduate school i wasn't sure which of the two advisors i wanted right and they said well come out in the summer we'll yep. pay you a small summer stipend yeah You'll work one month in one lab, one month in the other. And then when grad school starts, you can pick which lab you want to continue in. Right. I didn't pick. I kept working in both. Yeah. But I got projects going. If you have to start research projects in your first term in graduate school, when you're taking three graduate level classes that are like new to you, and it's like a different difficulty level than you're used to in undergrad, maybe. Or it's like, it's not reading a textbook anymore. It's reading journal papers, right. which are just harder to get through. Like you haven't learned how to read a paper well yet. And there's all this math in there you don't know or analysis. And you just feel like you're behind all the time. It's like, yeah. so so the classes are are not not easy. Um, and and they, they're time consuming. And to, if you wanna start the ball rolling on a project, that's impossible. Like you won't be able to have a life outside. And I just got lucky that I was able to start my project yeah. before. And that ball is easier to move when it's going. Yeah, no, it's funny. Yeah, you, I, I think that's the first time we've ever talked about that. But yeah, because I did feel that pressure on me because I was doing both. Yeah. Where I probably would have been better off if I had a head start to focus on nothing but the research. So that right. the ball was rolling. Yep. But, yeah, so get that. but so one of the big things is like, you know, I like I truly do believe that um, and this is not just psychology. This probably applies to every single academic discipline for which there are not ready market applications. So for example, this is not gonna uh, apply to engineering, yep. pharmacy, or economics, uh, you know, things like that. Th areas where you could, like economics is not as applicable mm -hmm. as engineering, but it's pretty solid. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so fields like psych, sociology, anthropology, English literature, all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> It's like a Ponzi scheme, um, you know, like Rutgers University posts a tenure track tomorrow position for any of these disciplines. They're probably going to get four or 500 applications. Um, every single one of them either has a PhD, is two months away from getting their PhD, or has a minimum of one, often several postdocs under their belt. And yep. only one of them is going to get the job. And meanwhile, it's like, you look at you just look at it logistically like what does a typical tenured professor have like at any one time three to six uh grad students plus postdocs that are supervising at any one time well mm -hmm. okay so so we're talking like they are training three to six times as many profs as is replacement level but it's even worse than that because that because they're a prof for years yeah exactly so they're not gonna they're not quitting in the next two years yeah. right so, so there's that. And then on top of that, the universities are economizing away from tenured positions as much as they can. They're having massive online classes, larger yep. in-person classes. They're getting grad students, postdocs, adjunct instructors to teach the classes. They are doing everything they can to avoid because tenure is so expensive for them.
-hmm. And but it's like, meanwhile, it's like there's this huge conflict of interest for professors to tell uh, aspiring graduate students about this, because the thing is, if they don't have that three to six grad students working for them, then their lab is going to underperform compared to their peers and then their mm -hmm. development gets stilted. And if they're only a tenure track prof, oh yeah. God, forget about it. Like they can't afford to tell you the truth. Yeah. So yeah, once they get tenure, then they can, can cut back. Uh, but before then it's, yeah, they need to, to be pumping out stuff, but they, they, it's, it's not just about having a lot of students though, because their tenure review will depend on connections they make across the field. And mm -hmm. so they need to make sure to collaborate and they need to make sure that their students who move on to postdocs reflect well, because these other people who hire them as postdocs are going to be writing tenure letters for them potentially. And so they need to be a good example. So they, they are really, I, I don't think it's that they're like, I don't think they're trying to like do wrong by the students. They're not trying to set them up to fail. They really want their students. Oh, to absolutely. Succeed. They have a huge interest in that. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. They, they really want you to teach you well, to push you hard, to make yeah. you successful because it, like it's an MLM. The more successful the downstream is, they yeah. get a reward. Right, um, exactly. It reflects well on them to be able to look, look, this, per, this grad student of mine is now a prof at Harvard. And, and then also yeah. a productive colleague for the next 20 years that you can like help yeah. each other build up with. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, so like, I don't think there, there's any maliciousness in the faculty members. They're, absolutely not. Absolutely. Um, yeah. but, but, but yes, they do have to take more than, than feasibly could, re, could be a, a given to the universities in the world. Um, there are a couple of things that that help out though, like in Europe. Um, I don't remember which countries, or if it's it may be an EU thing, or I, I don't I don't know exactly. But there's like a mandatory retirement age. Ugh. So once you're a certain age, you have to retire. In that way, it opens up a spot for for a younger faculty member. Ugh. And um, that is like really hard for some faculty members because they're doing what they love. There's, yeah. there's a really well uh, regarded vision scientist named um, Jan Kunderink. And uh, he, you know, had a um, very successful lab. I mean, he has over 36,000 citations. Like he's got just tons of articles published. I mean, like his, his H index is 84. Like, that's like beyond elite, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Like this is one of the most like well-published persons. Like they just have tons of stuff. But right. he had to retire. And so now he's yeah. just like a visiting scholar in a younger faculty member's lab because <laughs> he wants to keep doing what he loves. He didn't want to retire. Right. But but the system is set up so he has to. Or like there's a professor at York's Glendon campus. Glendon is the French campus for York University who he he was i think he was at harvard um and then he went to um uh to paris um and but then paris was gonna make him retire and so he yeah he was at harvard yep and so then he goes to paris he has to retire he's now at york university um because in, he left Paris because he didn't want to retire in Canada right. and the U.S. Right. don't have those laws. Um, but but that means like these faculty members can work and work and work and they don't have to retire like because they don't want to like they're like. Why would they? Yeah. It's a great job and you're yeah. already the best part. You worked your ass off to get there. Why would yeah. you want to like get off the get off the train any earlier than you had to? Because it's like you you are what you were you are where you work to get to, and it's yes. great. And but that means it's just even longer for spots to open up. Exactly, um, in, especially in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and yeah. yes, so it's just it's a tough market. But I do want to say about like the baseball analogy, while I do think it is apt, especially to lots of fields, and you're right, it's not going to apply to engineering or computer science, 
In fact, in computer science, like there are applicants, they could have more faculty members, but at the bar they want for their faculty members, they're having trouble finding them because the big tech companies are hiring them away so quick. Yeah. Well, and it's um, like, because there are so few <laughs> applications for most of psychology, it actually frees the university to offer weaker and weaker compensation packages because they realize that they're competing against nobody. Yep. Like they're not competing against um, Facebook to get you. They're competing yep. against nobody. And it's now, like the data analytics, like you said, a lot, a lot of your like people that used to work with, they've left psych and they've gone into like statistical analytics kind of stuff. Yep. Like, my experience, most psych uh, grad students, they don't, they don't really like stats. They do it as a me. They do, they do it because it's necessary. But that's not what they're there for. Yes, and I definitely like, know a lot of people like that. I was one of them, right? <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, if your big interest is psychology, is like I don't know, language acquisition, you will learn statistics so that you can do that work. But that's just a means to an end. Right. And so if you have to, if you can't get that tenured position, would you have wanted to spend all those years in order to have a career that was dedicated to nothing but the burden? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like this is the thing you never, you did this like because you had to, not because you wanted to. And now that's all you do. But, but with psych, um, I do feel like, yes, if you do like the stats, you are well prepared for other yeah. jobs. Oh, absolutely. So th there are other fields you could be worse off. Right, but um, then it's, it's like for those, it, it's like you would have like, it would take you six years in a psych PhD, master's PhD program to gain the level of uh, statistical analytic competence that you would have gotten in like a year if you just dedicated yourself right to that. So it's like even the good part of it, like it's really inefficient. It's like it is. But um, one thing I have learned about that is, um, so I've been in, in my journey to get a full time job. I've been doing adjunct teaching. Yes. And I was teaching for a computer science program. So again, it was my computer science that helped me out here. But the reason I got the job was because I had a different background and was used to talking to people from different fields. Okay. And so I was teaching for a specific program that was made for people who wanted a master's degree in, in computer science, but who did not have an undergraduate degree. And mm -hmm. so I, t I was teaching mostly classes for this year long program that is like getting you up to speed. Got and um, I, I'd be teaching the students and they would come to me in office hours and stuff and talk about how, how they felt like when they're done with this program, are they going to do okay in those classes in, with the, the programmers who right. are now in the master's degree, who have a bachelor's degree, who mm -hmm. have been programming for four to 10 years, you know, a lot more, right. how are they going to do it? And I went on to see the students who I taught the first term were like the first students to get like internships and full-time jobs. And the reason is, is because there are a lot of computer scientists. So like, yes, you're not going to compete against somebody who's been programming 10 years. If what the job is for is for this person needs to be like the best programmer. But what there are jobs looking for is we need somebody who can talk to the programmers and also talk to the C-suite, like the, the CEOs and all those or other managers yeah. who can, can talk across departments because there was a lack of these communication skills or other soft skills in computer programming departments in, in businesses. What you do at Inatech is you take the specifications from the customers and you bring them down to the software engineers. Yes, y yes, that's, that's right. Well, then I just have to ask, why couldn't the customers just take them directly to the, to the software people, huh? Well, uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, because engineers are not good at dealing with customers. What, what would you say you do here? Well, look, I already told you, I deal with the goddamn customers so the engineers don't have to. I have people skills. I am good at dealing with people. Can't you understand that? What the hell is wrong with you people? Yeah, it's, and, it's, like, and, it's like the connective tissue of the organization or something like that. Yeah, and so like what, what my students were hired for is 
because they were good, good programmers, we prepared them well. Like when I've been teaching the, the master's level courses that is students who came from the undergraduate. And then I see what I was teaching in the second year classes to second term classes to the students who are new. It's like, we prepared them well, we got them up to speed real fast. And mm. maybe they were working really hard because they were so nervous about not being as good. But like, I, I felt we prepared them well. And so when I see some of the students now in who, who didn't do that program, who had their undergraduate degree, and I see what they're doing, it's like, oh, it's like, they, they are missing some skills, even tech skills. So, so I don't feel like these new students are that much at a disadvantage, but they do have the big advantage of having different experiences and the businesses want those. Like that student who got the first job that I taught, yeah. she was a dancer. Yeah. Well, so wouldn't this actually kind of help the point I was making, which is that these are people that took one year and just focused on this one thing. Where I guess. Like, like if you're in, in psych, it's like, yes, you will gain skills in statistical <laughs> analytic software, but mm -hmm. it'll take you six years. Like if you just wanted to develop enough competence to get a, an analytics job, you could have just taken one year and just locked yourself into like analytic software and have gotten yes. be better off than if you just, because it's, okay. you know what I mean? I see that. Yeah, I see that. I was thinking more as they have a different experience and the employers value that. Okay. And these psych students will as well. And that will be valuable. But you are right. They've dedicated so much more time to their education when somebody who might have gotten a math undergrad and then did like a master's in data science. Yeah. Um, where I, I wasn't thinking about, oh, their undergraduate already degree is already different. And so if they went and did the data, data science stuff, they yeah. already have that diversity of experience that is like, you have a different background, which means you'll look at it a different way. And that mm -hmm. might bring something new to our approach that would be valuable. Yeah, that does happen sometimes too. <laughs> I've been the beneficiary of that one time of, you know, someone hired me and, you know, I got a great internship during undergrad and uh, the person who hired me was an MBA with an engineering background. And he said part of the reason why he picked me was because like with my psych background, he's like, yeah, I could hire another business commerce student or engineer, but it's like, I'm not gonna get much different perspectives from them, but I might from you. Yes. So, you know, that does happen here and there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. What recommendations or advice would you give to someone who was, say, 18, 19, thinking of going into psych as an undergrad program? And then what advice would you give to someone who's like in undergrad considering like academic psych grad school? So like not clinical, but like, you know, like yeah. or developmental or whatever. I mean, like, so the reason I went into it is because my goal as an undergrad was I'm going to go learn something so that I can go get rich. And when I learned then, oh, what kind of I might have to do to get rich, I didn't really like it. And so if you see yourself enjoying what you're doing in grad school, I think it's all right to do it. Like, I don't, like, go ahead. Um, now you will feel frustrated at times. I had a friend who, he was a physics major in undergrad, he hated it. So when he finished undergrad, he was looking for a job outside of his degree and he spent like nine months without a job and he kind of felt bad and he was the only friend who hadn't moved on to do something different then when he got a job he liked it and he was like the first of our friends to buy a house mm -hmm. and like be be established in in where money wasn't an issue and like just well off and and moving up the ladder and and so there were times when it's like, yeah, if I had just gone to work right away, I would already be moving up my ladder. And now I'm going to have to start at somewhere entry level mm -hmm. and I'm way behind. Like I'm going to start lower than I should. And that's, that's a frustrating thing to think about. But I was making enough as a undergrad or as a grad student or a postdoc that I could live and be fine. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to keep doing that until I finally found this permanent job. And so it's like, I'm luckier than a lot of people might be. But I kept at it because I kept looking for other jobs. And, you know, I found some and I, I was working as a contractor for a little bit on virtual reality stuff. It's like, that was fun. But anytime I was trying to look for like a permanent job, I didn't quite fit right. Or it was something that it's like, 
I don't want to do that. And so it's like, I was prepared. I could have possibly gotten some of these other jobs, but it's like, I just don't like it enough to where I wanted to do that. And so I'm just going to keep looking until I find something I like. And so if you like research and it interests you and, and you don't mind the sort of tediousness of it, I would say go for it. Like in psychology, you'll have skills, like especially in a cognitive science area, programming is much more becoming part of it. So pretty much everyone will get some basic programming um, at, at most schools now when you're getting your degree because you're going to program your experiments. So I think you're able to get transferable skills. And so if you enjoy it, go for it. As long as you realize that there's still a good chance I won't make it. And it's like, I'm, I'm changing fields. I'm in analytics now and not in psychology. It's still an academic position and I'm very excited and happy for it. Um, but it still is sort of, you know, a little different than how I might've thought my path would go. Right. So yeah, well, like my advice I'll give and feel free to add to it in any way you want. Um, to someone who want, who's like in high school or, or, or is, you know, maybe just like done high school and want, is considering university psychology, I would suggest like, okay, so if you just simply need a degree of any kind to get to do what you want to do, uh, and psychology interests you like more than others, then do it. Um, if you want to get into a mental health profession, then yeah, then it makes absolute sense to do it. Um, although if you are, I would strongly consider like not just clinical psychology, but also like counseling psych and social worker um, um, paths. Because with clinical psych, it's like, first off, incredibly hard to get into. Like it's it's roughly as hard to get into clinical psych as it is to get into med school. And so it's like, if you can get into clinical psych, you probably could have gotten to med school. And if you can get into med school, you might be better off going to med school. Um, but then also it takes seven additional years after undergrad, and you are going to pay part of the tuition because like, you know, you'll get partial stipend, but not complete. Um, whereas especially in Canada. Yeah. You will make more in Canada, money. You get much less than in, in, in okay. big schools. Like Rutgers gave a way better stipend than like York or U of T. Right. And you, and you know that because your wife's a clinical psychologist, right? Yeah. 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 But yeah, so it's, it's like what's happening is in the mental health field is there's a lot of economization uh, and it's not just it, it, it's happening all over the place. Like in, in academia, they're hiring 10 year track positions, professors less and getting someone else to do the job, grad students, postdocs, adjuncts and so forth um, in healthcare, There's like a lot of over the last 15 years or so. Um, a lot of jobs that were done, that were registered nurse jobs are now being done by licensed professional nurses, um, who can do almost everything that an RN can do, but not everything, but you know, you can pay them less. And so a lot of RN jobs are being replaced with LPNs. And, and then likewise, um, yes, as a clinical psychologist, you can charge more, you can get away with charging more per session than a social worker based psycho, uh, mental health clinician. But the problem with that is, is that you're going to get undercut by those social workers. So you will lose clients because maybe you're charging 200 bucks an hour, whereas they're only charging 120, right? And so. certain insurances will only pay if it's the social work because it's cheaper. So you might be having to have your patients all pay out of pocket then. Right, right, right. Which is like that, that cuts your market down massively. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So that's for undergrad. And then for grad, I basically would say, only go if 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 you are relevantly similar to John, which basically means that you genuinely find it fun and interesting. And so you could see yourself spending until you're 32 working frequently 50 to 70 hour weeks on this stuff. And then at the end of it, not get tenure track position and then have to go and complete, find a completely different path. Like John's lucky. He doesn't have to do that because he has a computer science background too, which is helping. But if you don't, you might not get a data, a data analytics full-time teaching job at Northeastern University of Toronto, right? So I would say only do the grad school route if you love what you do so much that you could see yourself spending eight years on this and then not get the job and have to go back and figure out something completely different and still say it was worth it. I'm glad I had the experience. If you can't say that though, you're begging for nervous breakdowns and, and, and maybe worse. And like, I'm sure you've seen some people, not just me have them. Mm -hmm. you know? So, and, and so I, yeah, I would, I would say, I don't disagree with that. Uh, but the other thing I would point out is in your undergrad, make sure you look at different possibilities. Mm. Like look at 
or do an internship with a business. Mm. Um, and and so like maybe had I seen other potential like computer science things that weren't running a database, I would have liked it a little more. Um, and I, I would have changed what I did. Um, so, so I would say find a way, I don't like there might be university clubs or stuff that that just talks to different businesses and gives you insights into what it's like to be there or or like places have these like sort of job fairs where you can at least go and talk to people and hear what it's like there those are great great things because the more things you look at the more likely you'll find the path that interests you most <laughs>